We are in Philemon. Um, we're actually wrapping up this Sunday. This is the last Sunday that we'll be in the book of Philemon. And, uh, and it's been an absolutely incredible sermon series yeah, to think that this short little book, the shortest of Paul's letters, uh, could be so jam-packed with so much of God's truth and the implications that that has on our lives, even today, that these ancient words are not dead words, they're very much alive and they still uh, have power, power to transform and, and, and to, to bring about so much of God's uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful character and, and, and the things that he does for us. And so uh, we're closing it, it all down today, we're, we're wrapping it up. Um, and so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it one last time. That's what I've been doing throughout this entire series. I've been reading the whole book. It's short enough that we can get through it. And so I'm going to read it one last time, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get to work. Uh, if I was to kind of categorize these last three Sundays, I would say this, that the first Sunday was very much orthodoxy, all right? So right doctrine. We lifted up a couple of the themes that we see in the book of Philemon, and we tried to uh, give some working definitions and then kind of say, what are the implications of that? Last week, I would maybe say it was a little bit more orthopraxy. Uh, this is the right practice. Well, how are we then to kind of take all that we've learned and flesh it out um, and, and from a biblical or theological perspective, all right? And so this week, I would say it's going to be author. Messy, all right, so author messy, um, and here's why. It's because we're going to get into some things that, that are really messy. Um, it's what I like to call the gray, and there's a lot of gray, uh, not in God's word, but in the way that we are to navigate through it. And so I'm going to say some things that I, I'm pretty sure some of you will hear and go, I hear you, but that's really difficult, or how do I do that, or that's challenging, or you don't know my situation. It's just messy, but there is enough grace to engage in the messiness of our lives. We have a simple gospel for salvation and a complex gospel for sanctification because our lives are incredibly complex. The complexity of humanity, I like to say. It doesn't mean that the gospel cannot be applied. No, 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 the gospel has the power to engage in the messiness of our lives. And so that's what this Sunday is gonna feel a little bit like. And so let me read it one last time. We'll pray and then we'll get to work. Hear these words of our Father. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon and our dear friend and co-worker, to Afia, our sister, to Akipas, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and me. I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very own heart. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed may not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief Time so that you might get him back permanently. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me since I hope that through your prayers I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings and so do Mark and Atticus and Demas and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would meet each and every one of us where we are today. 
that we would have a powerful encounter with you. That God, you would dig deep into the dark areas of our lives. That we would recognize that we are loved, that you have chosen us, that you've redeemed us, that we cannot outrun the grace that flows from you. And so God, would you make us a people who surrender it all to you? I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy, to whisper words of doubt in our ears. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body and think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us no say and do. May we see a gospel that is powerful enough to navigate through the messiness of our lives. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Now, look, we've, we've walked through quite a bit and we've spoken quite a lot about what we see in the book of Philemon. And one of those things, which I, I believe is, is, is very, very important, and uh, even as I look at uh, the world we now live in, we need so much of it, uh, th that thing is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big deal. It's, it's a massive deal in the book of Philemon. I mean, it, it comes up over and over and over again. It may not use the exact word forgiveness, but, but it's there. We can see it. That, that there's this call for Philemon to forgive Onesimus. If you look deeper, you'll see that there's even a call for Onesimus to forgive himself. We also see the, the, the forgiveness that comes from God to us. Forgiveness is a big deal. See, in the Bible, forgiveness refers to, to the release or the termination of, of something. Let me be specific. You see, forgiveness, the forgiveness we have in Christ includes absolving sinners from God's just punishment and completely dismissing all charges against us. That's forgiveness. I mean, we read about this in, in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, a very well-known verse in a very well-known chapter. Paul writes, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There's now no condemnation. This word condemnation is both a building term, a construction term, and then also a courtroom term. That you are no longer condemned. When we look at a building that is condemned, we say it is unfit for use. Therefore, it must come down. And we've been told you there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You are no longer useless, but useful. A courtroom term to say that, listen, you are condemned, you are punished, charged. And yet, because of the forgiveness of God, Paul writes, no, no, no. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've been set free. That's what forgiveness does. It releases. In Colossians 1 Verse 14, Paul writes, in him we have redemption. We touched on this a little bit in the last few weeks, the idea of being redeemed. It's a, it's a word that we don't use too often, but it's so powerful to the Christian. To, to be redeemed is just to think of, 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 of being purchased. You were once a slave. You had a master, but then someone comes and purchases you, and we've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. He shed every single drop. And so we, we move from this, this one master who is evil to a master who gives life and life to the full. And so in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is a big deal. Forgiveness in the, in the Greek means a, a formal release from an obligation or a debt. It's a pardon or a cancellation. We have been forgiven by God, a a full, full pardon from the penalty of sin. And, and I hope that you believe that as a Christian, that you've received in Christ a full pardon. Look, the evil one is going to do everything to whisper in your ear to go, you know what, it, it wasn't a full pardon. He forgave you of this, this, but there's no way he'll forgive you of this. You must not believe that lie. 
the forgiveness that we get from God is a, is a full pardon. Full pardon from the penalty of sin. God's compassionate forgiveness of our sins should be the standard and the power by which we forgive others. So if we believe that we have been forgiven, then, then that has an implication on our lives in the way that we navigate this life, in the way that we engage one another on this issue of forgiveness. Ephesians 4 verse 32, we're told, and be kind and compassionate to one another. Why? Because God is kind and compassionate to us. Forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. We, we, when we talk about generosity, here's what we say. We say we believe that God has called us to be generous because he has been generous to us. It's the same implication. Because we have been forgiven, then, then we are called to forgive. Now, I know that it's easier to say than actually do. Can we be real for a moment? I know lots of pretending and performing that we do, but just for now, I would ask that you, you leave your version of social media on social media, and let's just be real for a moment. It is easier to say than to do. Because generally what comes up is, but you have no idea what happened to me. I, I hear you on it, but, but listen, the things that happened to me, the things that were done to me, the things that were said about me, I just, I just don't know. You see, I, I think we tend to land there because for many of us, forgiveness can seem like a sign of weakness or, 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 or a, a way of, of letting an undeserving person triumph. That's generally how most of us think of forgiveness. However, it has nothing to do with weakness and it has nothing to do with our emotions. Instead, hear me, forgiveness is a deliberate decision. It is a deliberate decision. It is, it is a choice and it is a powerful choice. It is a powerful choice. Also important to know is that it it's not just given because someone deserves it. Let me say that again. It's not just given because someone deserves it. And here I want us to think the gospel. If you're pushing back on that statement and going, oh, oh no, hold on, hold on, no, 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 no. Think the gospel. Because you don't deserve God's forgiveness. Now, now, we live lives where we think we do, right? Because if asked, what kind of person are you? Most of us in here would go, I'm a good person. And I would go, okay, in comparison to who? To the person next to you? Probably. In comparison to God, you're nowhere close. You don't deserve God's forgiveness, and yet... And yet, or should I rather say, but God, you don't deserve forgiveness, but God, rich in mercy, Ephesians 2 tells us, rich in mercy, he grants us forgiveness. How, how look, we're going to get into some real practical things, but, but we need to anchor ourselves in that. Because for many of us, no, 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 we, we're, we're more driven by our feelings. We're, we're driven by our emotions. We're driven about, by what the next person is doing. Instead of saying, if I say that I'm a child of God, if I've crossed the line of faith, if I say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, then I'm driven by completely different things. And as we talk about forgiveness, it's recognizing that, you know what, I don't deserve forgiveness. This is why I say often, I can't get over the gospel. Because I, I, I sometimes can't fathom, I can't fathom how God would save someone like me. You know why? Because I look long enough in the mirror, and I'm not talking about the one that's in your bathroom, I'm talking about the Word of God. I look long enough in here and I go, I, like that. All, all, the, all the terrible people that you think are in here, like the ones you're like, you, you, like you put your nose up, and like, I can't believe they did that. That's you. 
You are not the hero of the story. You're more Goliath than David. And yet, and yet because he is rich in mercy, he grants us forgiveness. I can't get over it. And at the same time, it's like, it's like I just want to run to God the Father and be like, like just fall on my face and just go, I, I'm so in awe of you. That has implications on our lives. It has implications on how we forgive. Now, with that as our foundation, I truly believe that forgiveness often comes with a lot of misunderstandings. It does. It comes with a lot of misunderstandings. Many people may find themselves confused about what it truly means to forgive. And because they're confused by this, it it leads to a a, a sense of reluctance to forgive. You see, it's, it's so much easier to justify our grievances and bitterness. We're really good at that. It's so much easier to do that than to forgive and to release. So maybe instead of telling you what forgiveness is, let's spend some time talking about what forgiveness is not. And and, and here's the thing, even though I'm telling you what it's not, at the same time I'm going to be telling you what it is, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what it's not. Got a few things here that I've listed out. Number one is forgiveness isn't about excusing the behavior or action. That's not what it is. It's not, it's not about, you know what, look, I forgive, and you can just kind of continue doing whatever you want to do. That's, that's not what it is. Abuse, neglect, whether physical or emotional, and these days we've got to add spiritual, whether it's manipulation, whether it's betrayal, slander, rage, etc., etc. all of these are forms of wrongdoing. We call them out. They're forms of wrongdoing. And when faced with such violations, they There are no valid excuses. Can we be real for a moment? There are, and we will find ways, right? I'm sure you've heard things like this. Uh, He he didn't mean to. Okay, but he did it. Here's another one. She didn't know any better. Okay, but a wrongdoing still happened. Or, Or maybe... She was just having a bad day. I hear that one a lot. Or, or he was merely just acting out of his own pain. We, pain. We've, got to, we've got to excuse him for doing that. No, 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 hold on. It's still wrong. And the call to forgive is not to say, no, you know what? We, we don't care about these things anymore. No, 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 no. God will still list out your sin. You read Ephesians chapter 2. It's, it's there goes and tells us, here's who you were. And he lays it out, and he lays it out, and he lays it out, and he lays it out. And then it's, but God. So forgiveness isn't about excusing the behavior or the action. No, 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 no. We cannot do that. We need to talk about it. And here's where it gets messy, because often we don't want to. A little bit to last week's sermon. If you didn't listen to it, I encourage you to go and do so. It's, it's, it's where we go. This is so messy. This whole idea of forgiveness and reconciliation and, 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 and unity, it's, it, it gets sticky because now we've got to talk about some things that we feel uncomfortable talking about. Hello, anyone? It's so much easier just to go, you know what, let me just step over that. It's fine. Had a really, they had a really bad day. It's just let it go. Forgiveness is not that. It's, it's talking about it. It's, it's in getting to that point where you own your part in it. As the offender, you own your part to it. You, it's an opportunity to be able to explain and to walk through things and to unpack and what was going on. It's, look, I'm not saying that, that because the things that you're going through don't matter. No, 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 no. Let's unpack that. But we still need to recognize that the action and the behavior was wrong. And then we apply the gospel. Then we forgive. Here's another one. For, forgiveness is not forgetting. I hear this one a lot. 
Huh? Forgive and forget. Well, no, hold on. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness and forgetfulness are not related. In, see, in many cases, forgetting a hurt or injustice, it can be harmful to you. Let me give you an example. If, a, if, a, if you have a friend who has the habit, who is in the habit of gossiping about you, then it's, then it's actually best that you remember that that's what they do. Why? So that you might be careful what you share to them next time. You see, by remembering when you've been hurt, you, you can now guard yourself against, against repeated or similar offenses. This is where we sometimes talk about having boundaries. It's, so it's, it's because you remember, but you're still called to forgive. Let the wise old words ring true here and let them give us some guidance. Proverbs 26 verse 11 says this, as a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. See, when you, when you remember, you're just saying, hold on, I, I, I need to be careful about how I, how I handle myself in these kinds of situations or what I share to certain people. But even in that, the call is still to forgive. You still might be going, mm, oh, no, I think I know a verse that talks about forgiving and forgetting. Okay, you'd be right. Good on you. You read your Bible. You might say, oh, no, what about Isaiah 43 verse 25? Which says, I am the one, I sweep away your transgressions, this is the Lord speaking, for my own sake, and remember your sins no more. Ah, I see. Forgive and forget. And I would say, no, hold on. Hold on. Because if we're saying that God here doesn't remember, then we have a problem with who God is. See, a, a God who forgets, can he really be God? You and I forget. We forget all the time. You can't even remember what you ate last week, Tuesday for lunch. And if you're trying to think about it, stop. Stay focused, don't, don't do that. But the question is, can an all-knowing, all-powerful God ever truly forget? No. The answer is no. His, his mind is infinitely perfect and powerful. And so if that is the case, then what is Isaiah talking about here? That, that's kind of given, given birth to this, this way of living that we forgive and we forget. Is it, is it not connected there? No, no, no. What Isaiah is doing here, he's telling us more about the character of God. He's telling us that God willingly, hear this, willingly chooses to remember your sins no more. Therefore, it, it isn't so much that the knowledge of our sins and rebellious actions have been erased from God's mind. No, no, that's not the case. Instead, God promises us that he will not remember our shortcomings and sins, which means that he will, he will not remind himself of our failures, and he will not remind us of them either. That's a God I want to serve. That they, they play no part in him determining or shaping our relationship with him. He's not going there, mm, you know what? But I remember two weeks ago, hold on. That's, that's not the God that we serve. He will never throw our failures and our sin in our faces or, or subtly drop hints about the different ways that we've come up short. No, friends, we do that. Sometimes it's how we hold people ransom. Yeah, but remember, I forgave you. So therefore, you need to X, Y, Z. God says, no, I don't, I don't do that. I know exactly what you did. And still, I initiate with my hand of grace to forgive. Forgiveness is not a weapon. It's not a weapon, and yet so many of us treat it that way. God knows everything about you. He knows everything about you, and still, he loves you. He loves you enough to redeem you. He loves you enough to justify you. He loves you enough to liberate you. He loves you enough to sanctify you. He loves you enough to lay out all the promises that are yes and amen in Christ for you. And so forgiveness is not forgetting. It's releasing 
It's recognizing everything that has happened, everything that has occurred, and still to go, you know what, I release you. There's another one. Forgiveness doesn't mean my pain is not important. It doesn't mean that my pain is not important. I, I, I like to say it this way. If it, if it matters to God, then it matters to us. And let me tell you, God, God hates it. God, hear me, God hates it. He hates it when you experience all this pain B- because of the brokenness of this world. He hates it. He hates it because that's not how this world was meant to be. That's not how this world was meant to be. It's us. It's us who ushered in this havoc and this chaos through our own disobedience. But because God is rich in mercy, he, he's been on a rescue mission for us since Genesis 3. God, God cares about your pain. If you've ever wondered if he cares about your pain, you look to the finished work of Jesus. You look to the cross. That is evidence that he cares about your pain. He does not want you to live in this pain. Psalm 56 beautifully reminds us that God has collected our tears and has noted each one. Let me me read it to you. Psalm Psalm 56 verse 8 says this. He says, you keep track of all my sorrows. All my sorrows. even, Even the one that you're hiding right now. The one that you're not willing to share to anyone. God's keeping a track of it. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Can you imagine that? This this should should propel us to forgive because we're saying, you know what? I forgive you. And you know what? I don't I like I'm, I don't even need you to understand. Because the one who is seated on his throne, he understands. He's written every single one. He knows when it happened, how it happened, how it made you feel. This this overwhelming compassion reveals that even when we cannot feel his presence, our suffering is of great significance to him. God cares. And here at Root of Fellowship, because it matters to God, it matters to us, and so therefore we care. Gosh, I want to I, I do everything in my power to, to ensure that this is a community where people come and they know, they know that they will be loved, that they will be cared for, that your pain matters. And I know, I know out there there's so many different standards and, and so many different things and so many different opinions, but in here, you matter. And so when we ask what's wrong, we really mean it. It's, it's, not, it's not just a, a thing that we say. It's not just a phrase that we say out in the reception. If we recognize and we see that something's wrong and we want to engage, it's because we care about you. It's true. If it matters to God, it matters to us, and so forgiveness is, is not saying that my pain doesn't matter, that, oh, I'm called to forgiveness because they don't care about it. No, no, God cares. He cares. Here's one. Forgiveness and healing are not the same thing. This is a big misconception. Forgiveness and healing are not the same thing. Just, just because Philemon forgave doesn't mean that he was like, oh, I was instantly healed. He, he got the letter before Onesimus showed up. S- some would say, no, no, Onesimus was the one carrying it, no problem. And then even though he's sitting in his little room and he's reading it and he's in, in broken by the, by the beauty of the gospel and how he's been forgiven. And he goes, you know what? My step of obedience is to forgive. And so I'll do that. And he still had to walk out there and look at Onesimus and be like, I'm going to need some time. Forgiveness is a decision. It's a powerful decision. It is a supernatural decision. But healing is a process. Healing is a process. The two are not the same. And so for many of us, we'll go, I will forgive once I've healed. I mean, that could be forever. You, you've got this the wrong way around. No, 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 we forgive. We forgive first and then allow the process of healing to occur. See, forgiveness is a decision fueled, fueled by the power of the Spirit. That's why I say it's a supernatural decision. 
It's not easy, but, but in Christ, it is possible. Whereas healing, healing is the process whereby the wound, and no matter how deep it is, is tended to so that you might become healthy again. That's what healing is. And this takes time. It, it, it might even for many of us in here, depending on the wound, this might take your entire life this side of heaven. See, I generally think that the deeper the wound, the longer the healing time is. But I say that also knowing that we serve a God who can do whatever he wants on whatever time frame he wants. But generally, the deeper the wound, the longer the healing. Let, let me insert something that I know we all wrestle with and have to navigate with. This country went through a deep pain and has a deep wound in, in various places. And yet somehow we think, you know what, we can just turn the corner and we'll all be healed. Friends, it's a process. Healing takes time. But it doesn't mean that we don't forgive. See, by, by forgiving, we open the door to recovery, enabling the wounds to mend and, and, and then also to be transformed. God uses all of that to mold you and to shape you. F forgiveness activates healing. It activates healing. Healing requires time, patience. It's, it's nurturing. It's, it's being cared for. I've, I've learned this by walking with a lot of people through a lot of pain. That everyone has a different healing journey. It's, it's something that we like to do sometimes. We, we like to take a standard way of healing and then go, this is the application for everyone. And then when people don't fit in it, then we go, then something's wrong with you. No, 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 no. Everyone has a different healing journey, and it's, it's important for us to remember that, that it, is, it is unique for each individual. It is unique for every individual, even though the destination is the same for all of us. Everyone has a different path. So forgiveness and healing are not the same thing. So that means you can't be going, you know what, I'm going to wait until I'm okay, and then I'll forgive. Here's one, forgiveness. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. I want, uh, this was a tough one for me. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. You see, it is a common perception that forgiving an individual necessitates reconciliation. Forgiveness is essential. Don't get me wrong. It's essential for freeing oneself from the resentments and, the, and, and restoring one's capacity for, for love. That's, that's what essentially what forgiveness is. But, but you see, reconciliation, reconciliation is the act of restoring the relationship between the offender and the person offended. That's what reconciliation actually means. And, and this is not always the case. And I hate that it's not always the case, but it, it's just... That's the reality that we live in. See, the, the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation is, is massive. Similar to healing, that's what reconciliation is. It's a process. Whereas forgiveness is a decision. There's another difference. The difference between forgiveness and reconciliation is that forgiveness requires nothing from the person we are forgiving. Let me say that again. Forgiveness requires nothing from the person we are forgiving. Sometimes they don't even have to know that they're being forgiven. Whereas reconciliation requires repentance from the offender. And even then, and even then, he or she does not dictate the terms of reconciliation. It's messy. It's, it, it requires sitting at a table together and going, okay, so, so how are we going to do this? Powered by the gospel, how are we going to do that? That's reconciliation. Forgiveness is, I forgive you. Because of the overwhelming grace of God, I forgive you. I release you. 
But, but reconciliation, man, that, that requires sanctifying work. That requires so much of you leaning in. And at many other times, you're going to have to reach back and pull out forgiveness again. Because you're going to have some conversations here in this healing process, in this reconciliation. And then, oh, here we go. And then I said, I got to lean into forgiveness again. I often think of the many, many situations that we find ourselves in when we talk about forgiveness and reconciliation. Here's a big one. Should a, should a spouse forgive their wife or husband if adultery was committed? Let me go ahead and tell you. Yes. I went for that one because I know that's, that's, that's one where a lot of people are like, but wait, Only I'd like to tell you about the circumstances and that I'd love to hear them. In fact, I want to hear them, every single one. But the question is, should a spouse forgive their wife or husband if adultery was committed? Yes. This is both the command and the expectation from the scriptures. Here's the next one. But is reconciliation also expected? That depends. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we should all desire it. We should all desire it, but it depends. Oh, now, what does it depend on? Great question. On a number of factors. What's currently going on in the marriage? Is there ongoing unrepentant abuse happening in the marriage? Is there ongoing unrepentant adultery happening in the marriage? Is the one a Christian and unwilling completely? There's so much that needs to be taken into consideration. We have to sit at the table of healing, which is a process. But the only way that we can get to the table is forgiveness. Reconciliation requires repentance. It also requires the rebuilding of trust. And it is also ultimately dependent upon God's grace to accomplish it. So when I say I want to see reconciliation, it's because I believe in the power of the gospel. But I also recognize the messiness of us. And somewhere there, the spirit has a way of taking hold of us and doing a work in us and through us. But it's important that you know that forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. And so there are times where reconciliation does not occur. Doesn't mean that forgiveness did not occur. I'll give you one more. And that is forgiveness is not easy. Now I know this one you'd be like, oh no, we obviously know that one. I know. But it's always good to hear that forgiveness is not easy. That I, I cannot do this on my own. We cannot do this on our own. We need God's spirit to see us through it. You see, forgiving someone means letting go of the need to take revenge. Now again, super smart people in this room. We hear the word revenge and we go, you know what? I would never do that. Because we think revenge is sitting down plotting this incredible elaborate thing that you're about to do, ensuring the demise of the person that you are so upset with. That's what we think. And we go, I, I would never do that. But I need you to know that being mean is revenge. Denying someone of your presence is revenge. Being different to them, completely different to how you would be to someone, is, is like you need to dig deep in your heart and go, am, am I, am I, am I harboring something against someone? Not smiling to someone could be revenge. And I know many of us would be like, no, no, I'm such a wonderful person. I'm so amazing. And then there comes that person. Mm. Hello, everyone. Mm. Revenge. That you are holding on to something in your heart. You're holding on to unforgiveness. You're holding on to bitterness. You're holding on to resentment. Look, saying I forgive you doesn't make the pain seem little. That's not what I'm saying. 
And it doesn't mean that the offender is off the hook. Like now they can do whatever they want. No, 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 here's part of the messiness again. We have to sit down and evaluate and investigate and try to figure out what led to this conflict and what's going on and is it continuing and, and could it lead to more dangerous things. There's so many things that we have to take into consideration. But the call is still to forgive. Forgiving leads me to face up to the reality that I actually don't have to live in denial by pretending. It's just, it's just letting go. It keeps me from performing and having to wear a mask. You know that mask that I spoke about? I think it was last week. The mask of I'm fine, when actually you're not fine. Forgiveness just goes, you know, I'm taking the mask off. Because when I say I'm forgiving you, I'm having to tell you or I'm having to speak about those things that I was holding on to. And hear me, friends, as we pray, as we pray for the supernatural act to happen, as we pray for his grace and his power to forgive, it, it does something in us. When we lean into the gospel, what it does is that it draws us closer to the Father. That's what it does. Because you're going, I, on my own, I can't do this. I need one who is way more powerful than I am. And so it draws us closer to the Father. I said this last week, so I said again, for, forgiveness exemplifies our faith. It puts on display our faith. We, we can forgive our offenders or we can choose to hold on to resentment and bitterness. The second choice is the better, or the first one is the better one. See, refusing, refusing to forgive someone often will, will bind us to that person or to that thing for the rest of our lives. Every time I'm talking about something that, 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 that I go, man, I, it was a real challenge in my life. There was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of pain. And I go, you know what? But I, I've spoken about, I've forgiven. The healing has happened. This is great. Sometimes later in life, I actually realize I actually never forgave the person. Because all of a sudden it comes up and it comes up in different seasons of my life. Like I'm totally fine as a single guy. Then I get married and I'm in this new relationship with these new dynamics and there it is. It's like it was just waiting in the shadows. It's like, oh, I can't, can't get them now. They, they just got married and they've got someone and things. Are, I, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait because I know they haven't truly forgiven. I'm going to wait until they have kids. And then something in that new relationship is going to come up and then all of a sudden you're like, what on earth is going on? Why am I thinking about that person? Why am I thinking about that situation? Unforgiveness will bind us to someone or something. And yet we are called to release. See, if we refuse to let go, to let go of our anger, our bitterness, our resentment, we will never be free. We will never be free. I mean, even right now, that heaviness that you might be feeling, it just might be unforgiveness. It just might be unforgiveness. See, when someone, when someone truly hurts us, look, it's normal to feel angry. It's normal to feel angry. Anger is not necessarily a bad thing, but if we allow that anger to continue unresolved, we make it easy for bitterness to take root deep in our souls. And then all kinds of evil grow from this root of bitterness. And then the next thing you know, you have all sorts of weeds growing in your heart and mind, sucking all of life and joy from you. You know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is a weed killer. It suffocates bitterness and resentment. And God goes, listen, I, I've forgiven you. So do likewise forgive others. Now, for forgiveness can be a powerful journey. It's, it's a tough one, but it can be a powerful journey, though it often comes with its challenges. It takes true courage, true courage, and an open heart to confront the feelings that arise when we've been hurt. I've said it before and I'll keep saying it. Confession is incredibly courageous. Just being honest with yourself, just saying, you know what, 
when so-and-so did this, it hurt me. It, the, the, there's some deep insecurities in here. And so when you do this, or when you do that, and look, well-meaning, good intentions, I totally get that. Because often sometimes it'll be like, but I didn't mean to hurt you. Totally understand, and I'm so thankful that you didn't wake up this morning with this desire to go, you know what, all I want to do is hurt on it. I'm so thankful that that's not you. But still, there is something that you did. There is something that you said that hurt me. Can I be honest about it? Is there enough gospel relationship between us for me to sit down and go, hey, listen, I want to talk about some things because I'm holding on to something and I need to let it go. It's a powerful journey. And this journey of transformation, because that's what it is, this journey of transformation requires a few things from us. I'll be real quick and super practical and then I'll call the band up. I've said it a couple times in different ways, but now let me make it plain. It requires us to face our feelings. Men, and I know I'm generalizing here, because women are, are, are generally very good at doing this, but us as men, we just stuff it down. We just, no, 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 no. I gotta get to do this, I, gotta, I have to do that, I gotta, I gotta, no, no, no. We gotta face our feelings. Acknowledge the anger. Acknowledge the pain. Acknowledge the embarrassment. Acknowledge the shame, the bitterness. Acknowledge the resentment. These emotions are real. We've just done a series in the book of Psalms where, where the book of Psalms is filled with raw emotions. Emotions are real. But clinging onto them can be harmful. We don't make our feelings the CEO of our lives. They're great consultants. They help us navigate stuff, but, but they're horrible CEOs. They're even worse saviors. And so what we do is we say, listen, I, I need to acknowledge, I need to face them, and then I need to have the gospel applied over them. And so take a moment to admit those feelings. Take a moment to admit those feelings. And then lay them at the feet of Jesus. And then, and then I hope, because this is how God has beautifully designed us, is, is you're laying them at the feet of Jesus, but then you've also got a community around you that you're sharing them too. You cannot live in isolation. And, and, and this one is becoming way more personal to me over the years. The longer I do this, the longer I'm, I'm around people, the longer I lean into the lives of people and then trying to apply the gospel, the, 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 more, the more I realize how important this one is. Because because, because there are people who, who will take their own lives and then we will we'll sit this side and we'll go, but what on earth happened? I didn't know that they were carrying this. I didn't know that they were wrestling with the shame, wrestling with this anger and bitterness. We have a loving father who cares about every sorrow. And I'm gonna speak for this community. And I know many others, many other churches where we go, you know what, we care about you. Come and lay those, not just at the Father's feet, but then with us as well. So face your feelings. The second thing that we need to do is we need to remember our own forgiveness. Again, I've alluded to this. I won't be long on here, but, but, but remember our own forgiveness. Reflect on God's forgiveness to you. We need to come to the scriptures and we need to bathe ourselves with them. How often do you read scriptures out aloud to yourself? Because guess what? You need to hear them as well. Some of us, we're like, you know what? So-and-so needs to hear this. I've got a word for you. I've got this. No, you need to hear this yourself. You, you need to, to, to swim in the scriptures. Verses like Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. I need to hear that when I feel like, you know what? God's not going to forgive me of this one. Oh, I'm back again at the throne. I said I wasn't going to do it, but here I am again. Is he going to slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression? Maybe Psalm 103, verse 10 to 12. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Thank goodness. 
nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Matthew 6, 9 to 15. Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you find yourself in unforgiveness, it's because you've been led into temptation. You've been led into evil. 1 John 1 7 to 10, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Bathe in these scriptures, memorize these scriptures. Hide these scriptures in your heart because you're going to meet in this broken world. You probably won't even make it to Tuesday before you go, okay, I need to, I need to, I need to dig deep and forgive. Matthew 18, 21 to 22, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Don't we ask this all the time? As many as seven times, he asks. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. You just keep dishing it out, dishing it out, dishing it out. And, and hear me, you have enough. Some of us, we go, I don't know if I have enough. No, no, no. If you've received forgiveness from God, you have more than enough. If we want to see the transforming work happen in our lives as we forgive, we need to let go of revenge. I've said this. This is, this is crucial in breaking the cycle of hurt and moving towards healing. I really think much of the pain that we experience in this world is because we have this revenge mentality. It's like, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. And then that person goes, well, because that person did this to me, then I'm going to do this to you. And then... And then it just spreads and it becomes the norm. It becomes like today. But let us be a people who let go. Let us break that cycle and go no more. No more. And and you're going to have to anchor yourself in the gospel because there's going to be people around you that the, the, the crowd loves to go, oh, but you know, they did this. They did that to you. How could you? Don't, don't. Surely you don't have to forgive. No, no, no. I forgive because I have been forgiven. I often have to talk about this one. With people who've gone through tremendous pain because of someone else, is we have to learn to trust in the justice of God. It's, It can be so comforting to know that those who have wronged you will be dealt with justly. They will. Either by the mercy of the cross, which I hope is what all of us want, even to those who have offended us, is to experience the mercy of the cross. Or, if that's not the case, then they will experience the judgment of God's hand. Here's another way to say it. All of us are going to, here are your options, you're going to bow or bow. Those are the only options that we have, is you're going to bow or bow. You can bow now and see him as your savior. Or you will bow one day when he returns and see him as the judge. Here's how you know the gospel is transforming your heart. Is when your prayers are going, you know what, God, those people did X, Y, and Z to me. I'm praying for the mercy of the cross 
the justice that you poured out on your son Jesus so that those who look to him as Lord and Savior would be saved. I'm praying for that mercy on that person. Can you imagine how powerful that is? It requires supernatural power. Then we need to embrace the freedom that we have. See, the act of forgiving is liberating. It frees you from the chains of past grievances and opens the door to a future of unburdened resentment. It's to tell yourself daily, daily that I am free. And because I am free, I live as a free person. And free people forgive. Satan wants you to hear the chains that he used to have you in. And so you know what he does? He likes to drag them around you. Just so you would hear. Read Romans 7. Paul writes this. He goes, man, I'm, I'm like... The, the things I, I want to do, I don't do. And the things I should be doing, I don't do. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm caught up in this life where I'm like, I remember. And, and there he is. And, and he's whispering to me. And he's telling me all these things. Satan loves to do that. He knows that he can't get you because you've been saved. That you are in the Father's hand, but he wants to keep life and joy from you. And so you need to remind yourself that you're a free person. And forgiveness is one of those things that says, you know what? I'm, yeah, I'm still free. Yeah, you... You did this or they did this, but you know what? I forgive you and I'm still free. I release you, I'm free. God will deal with you. And then the last one, then we'll stand and respond. It really is the whole thing, the whole book, the whole, the whole scriptures, the whole Bible, it's our whole relationship. It's, it's, it's everything that, 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 that we are and that we do is, is we need to seek help from the Holy Spirit. If you're going to make this, if you're going to make this a part of your life and the rhythms to your life, you need to seek help from the Holy Spirit. It's the whole message. That I could give you tool after tool after tool. I could give you 10 steps. I could tell you, here's how you do it. Here's how you intro the conversation. I could give you all those things. But if you are not leaning into the work of the Holy Spirit, then, then those things just become really good books on a shelf somewhere. Seek help from the Holy Spirit to forgive and to heal. Especially... And this is the hardest, the hardest person to forgive. You're going to really need the Holy Spirit for this one. Is to forgive yourself. I said it last week, no one has hurt you more than you. No one has betrayed you more than you. No one has lied to you more than you. And so sometimes we find it really difficult to forgive ourselves. Because as I, you tell yourself, I, I, taught, I, was nev I would never, how many? I would never make a decision like that. I would never choose to do this. I would never respond this way. I would never think this way. And then you do, and then what do you, what do you have now? What are you left with? That's where performing and pretending kicks in. Because you are unwilling to forgive yourself. God sits on his throne and he goes, I've forgiven you. What on earth are you doing? What lies are you telling yourself? Seek help from the Holy Spirit. Philemon 25 says this. We've been ending every sermon with this as a benediction, but I'm going to end it as the sermon today. Where Paul writes, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's happening in your life. But my prayer to you is that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be with your spirit. I said this in the first sermon, that many of you are going to have to make some really difficult phone calls today or this week or in these next couple of weeks. You're going to have to set up some really difficult conversations. You're going to have to bring up some really painful things. But I, I need you to know that God covers you and that God is with you and that God loves you. 
and I have no idea how it's going to end. My prayer is that it ends with this incredible reconciliation and restoration and that you have the ability to move forward. But even if it doesn't, my prayer for you is that you would feel a sense of release. That you would feel that that burden is no longer on your shoulders. That you would leave that situation or that conversation with a sense of, I am free. I forgive in the name of Jesus because he has forgiven me. And so, Father God, we come to you asking for the supernatural power, for the supernatural work to occur in our lives. We thank you for the life of Philemon, of Onesimus, because through their lives we get to see this, this beautiful picture of what it looks like to, to have the gospel work in us. where the offender can repent and the offended can forgive. And all of us in here have been on both sides throughout our lives. We have done the offending and we have been offended. And so God, would you give us the ability to repent and to own up where we have wronged others And then, God, would you give us the ability to forgive where we have been wronged? God, I pray for the restoring of relationships. I pray for peace. I pray for unity. Whether it's in a marriage, whether it's a relationship between a child and a parent, whether it's siblings, whether it's friends, whether it's colleagues, whether it's someone in this very room, God, I pray that there would be enough power to cause us to take steps of obedience towards forgiveness, towards reconciliation, towards restoration, towards peace, towards unity. All of us are in desperate need of a savior. And it's to you that we cry out to. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.